Communication is relatively easy with an eyesight and earshot of one another, that is, when the communication is localized. As distances increase, communications become more difficult. The act of communicating over distance is called telecommunication. Given the technological world we communicate within today, it's hard to imagine a time when communicating across long distances was challenging. Yet, for centuries it was. Over time, people have developed increasingly more advanced telecommunication systems in order to send and receive reliable communications within the shortest amount of time possible. Historically, people have taken two approaches to long-distance communication. The first is to physically deliver a written hard copy communication via some kind of courier service. Examples of this are the carrier pigeon, the human runner, a horse or vehicle-backed rider such as the Pony Express. While this method affords the advantage of being able to send lengthy communications, the downside is the speed of delivery. For centuries, sending a hard copy message to someone a hundred miles away took the better part of a day, the time it took a messenger traveling on horseback to cover the distance. In order to increase the speed of message delivery, early telecommunicators relied on a second approach, which was to transmit coded signals. Visual signaling, or semaphore telegraphy, involves sending a visible sign. At its simplest, one might wave a flag or light a fire on a hill as a visual warning. First Nations people perfected smoke signaling and used varying numbers of puffs and by throwing substances on a fire, they added information to a signal by changing the colors of the smoke. The Greeks, Persians, Romans, and Crusaders all used smoke and fire signals of, for transmission of predefined information about singular occurrences. In the 14th century, nautical admirals used different colored pennants to communicate orders or coded messages to their ships. In the 16th century, British fire towers lined the coast and to this day are known as Beacon Hills. Every civilization used added elements that helped evolve visual signaling systems over the centuries. Late 18th century innovators were clearly well versed in the visual signaling methods of the past and they adapted these for their contemporary uses given the available and emerging technology of their times. Yet visual signaling systems remained plagued with one constant limitation. The receiver had to be able to see the signal in order to interpret it. Such factors, such as weather, time of day, and obscuring physical landforms, could all impede human sight lines. Moreover, unaided human eyesight only extended so far into the distance. Eighteenth century innovators sought to resolve these limitations. By 1757, English optician John Dolan developed a pivotal piece of technology that provided part of the solution. He developed the standard achromatic telescope. This meant that visibility on a line of sight between geographical points could be increased to tens of kilometers, and an indispensable tool of visual telegraphy thus became available. Telescope technology evolved, so did mechanical visual signal system designs. Key innovators between the late 17th and mid-18th centuries include British astronomer Robert Hooke in 1684, British-Irish teacher Richard Lovell Edgwart in 1760, German scientist Johann Bergstrasser in 1784. However, it was during the French Civil War with France surrounded by enemies that Claude Chappie proposed and constructed a visual telegraph line that allowed a message to be received in minutes rather than weeks. In this case, the French government could receive information and send orders in a time frame that far exceeded their enemy's ability to do so, which gave them a critical military advantage. This confluence of technological advancements, telecom design innovation, and urgent political circumstance created a tipping point for mass adoption of visual telegraph systems. French engineer Claude Chappie began working on visual telegraphy in 1790, and after several trials settled on a model that used two sets of jointed wooden beams mounted on a tower which operators adjusted from inside the tower to form a series of symbol shapes using cranks and wires. The visual mechanicals consisted of a long 4 meter by 30 centimeter rotating bar, the regulator, with two small rotating arms, the indicators on its ends, counterbalanced with metallic weights. While a regulator could be oriented horizontally, obliquely, or vertically, 
the indicators could be independently oriented in one of seven positions 45 degrees apart, giving a total of 98 combinations. Regulator and indicators were black painted to increase contrast against the sky. A series of these towers were built in a line across the countryside. To facilitate message transmission, Chappie and his brothers developed an operational protocol and a 92 symbol code book which allowed operators to send up to 8,464 words and phrases. Operators manned each tower, one used a telescope to watch for and record the incoming signal from the adjacent tower. Another manned and controlled the signal mechanism. Often a third served as a checker to ensure the sent message was accurately processed by the station down the line. The transmission process was a sequence of two steps and three movements. Step one, the setup. The indicator arms were turned to align with the crossbar, forming a non-signal. The crossbar was then moved into position for the current symbol. Step one, movement two, transmission. The indicator arms were positioned for the current symbol. The operator then waited for the downline station to copy it. Step two, movement three, completion. The crossbar was turned to a vertical or horizontal position indicating the end of the cycle. With this protocol in play, operators received, acknowledged, then copied the signal shape, thus moving the signal down the line as quickly as possible. At the end of the line, decoders compiled the collection of sent signals and recomposed the original message, which they then forwarded to an administrator. For the time, the communication speed was incredible. The average transmission rate was about two to three symbols per minute between stations, which meant that a signal could be sent across 230 kilometers from Paris to Lille in about 10 minutes. Speed, however, decreased at night and on inclement days. However, an entire message could be processed in under an hour. The success of Chappie's system resulted in lines and networks being built in France. The Paris to Lille line was completed in 1794. A line between Paris and Strasbourg was completed in 1798 and a series of smaller intersecting lines across churches, clock towers, and purpose-built hill towers wove across the landscape between these two trunk lines. In 1799, Bonaparte ordered construction of a line that could bridge the English Channel. These networks allowed for messages to flow not just one way, but now in multiple directions, which helped to create an integrated network national French telecommunications system. Proliferation began as other countries established their own semaphore telegraphy systems, lines and networks. In Sweden, Abraham Niklas Edelkrantz developed a shutter system in 1794, resulting in small semaphore telegraph connections between castles and fortresses in Stockholm, which got extended to Griselham and Åland. Unlike Chape's model, the Edelkrantz shutter system was based on ten collapsible iron shutters. The various positions of the shutters formed combinations of numbers which were translated into letters, words, or phrases via code books. The Swedes relied on a network of stations positioned at about 10 kilometers apart and used a similar operator system originated by Chappie. In the UK, Lord George Murray in 1795 installed a series of six shutter telegraph lines from London to Deal, London to Great Yarmouth, London to Portsmouth and Plymouth. The Murray system was replaced in 1816 with Sir Home Popham's more visible one-arm and two-arm systems. The first consisted of a single fixed vertical 30-foot pole with two movable 8-foot arms attached to the pole by horizontal pivots at their ends, one arm at the top of the pole and the other at the middle of the pole. These and additional lines operated until 1847. Other countries such as Denmark, Finland, Germany, Prussia, Canada, USA, India all adopted similar technologies and telegraph systems. Visual telegraph lines facilitated reliable and efficient long-distance communication, but infrastructure was expensive. The systems had high labor and administrative costs, they required well-trained and perennially attentive operators, although the telescope greatly stretched sight distances the systems remained reliant on visibility for message transmission, and their effectiveness remained hampered by light, weather conditions, and the fact that towers needed to be within sight of one another.
The demise of large-scale semaphore telegraphy systems by 1850 was a result of these factors outlined, and most significantly the advent of emerging new technology, electrical telegraphy and Morse code, which resulted in a more efficient system in terms of infrastructural operational costs and speed for facilitating long-distance communication. Meadow comments that regardless of the signal, whether it's gesture, fire, flag, smoke, all are quite ancient and are still used in some form, and, as new communications media come into use, they rarely displace earlier ones, although they induce change. He concludes, the fundamentals never change. Communication requires not only that a message be sent, but that it be received and understood, that transmission be reliable, that the proper representation must be chosen, and the appropriate media be used to assure transfer of information. For its part, visual telegraphy was a technology that revolutionized distance communication, for these were the first widely adopted international systems to dramatically reduce the time-distance problem that had plagued telecommunications for centuries. These coding systems represented the most innovative technology of the time, and provided the essential architecture for emerging telecommunication systems, such as sophisticated encoding-decoding of messages, transmission lines and processes, communication networks. All of these systems elements, in many ways, we still rely on today, albeit delivered through different media, whether it's phone, fax, email, or text.